this article took a cue from Nick Bostrom's 2005 A History of Transhumanist Thought, which was in turn an attempt at the retrospective construction of a genealogy of transhumanist thought spanning from the epic of Gilgamesh to Francis Fukuyama, who has famously declared transhumanism the world's most dangerous idea. Inevitably, all retrospective genealogies entail politics of appropriation and discursive capital. Whereas Zorg's article maintained it is actually strategic for the transhumanist movement to retrospectively co-opt Nietzsche into their ranks, Nick Bostrom, a co-founder of the Institute for Ethics, of, for, for, the, for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which publishes the chat magazine where the debate actually took place, seeks to avoid identification with this thinker. Bostrom quotes the following passage from Nietzsche. I teach you the overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? All beings so far have created something beyond themselves. And do you want to be the ebb of this great flood and even go back to the beast rather than overcome man? So thus spoke Zarathustra. As the monkey is a laughing stock, a thing of a shame for man, so shall man be a laughing stock for the overman, or the notoriously hard to translate evil man, alias superman or superhuman. Yet despite the apparently shared conviction that men, one way or another, shall or should ideally be over and done with one day, Bostrom notes that instead of a technological transformation, Nietzsche aimed at a kind of soaring personal growth and cultural refinement in exceptional individuals. Nietzsche proves ultimately irreconcil irreconcilable with transhumanism because of the latter's enlightenment roots, Bostrom writes, its emphasis on individual liberties and its humanistic concern for the welfare of all humans and other sentient beings. If Paul Eslub, who responded to the IEET debate on the pages of the Agonist, suggests that the radical challenge that is posed to the transhumanist philosophy and its idea of progress by Nietzsche's concept of the eternal return could be solved by, of all things, time travel, it is a bit of philosophical time traveling that Bostrom performs when pitching enlightenment against Nietzsche, Nietzsche who comes after it and as a vocal critic of its principles. Furthermore, Bostrom thereby ignores whole swathes of 20th century philosophy, such as deconstruction, that have crucially built on Nietzsche's thought. Nietzsche addressed copious amounts of critique to the ideals of truth and morality as they were handed between philosophers from Christianity through Enlightenment to German Romanticism, berating them for hypocrisy, such as in the following citation. For as long as there has been speech and persuasion on earth, morality has shown itself to be the greatest of all mistresses of seduction. All philosophers were building under the seduction of morality, even Kant. They were apparently aiming at certainty, at truth, but in reality at majestic moral structures. Ironically, the transhumanist vision presents itself as both majestic and moral. Consider the following passage from the transhumanist declaration appended as an addendum to Bostrom's article. It says, we foresee the feasibility of redesigning the human condition, including such parameters as the inevitability of aging, limitations on human and artificial intellects, unchosen psychology suffering, and our confinement to the planet Earth. And further on, transhumanists advocate the moral right for those who so wish to use technology to extend their mental and physical, including reproductive capacities. These ambitions are nevertheless still tame in comparison to the transhumanist manifesto, which entreats transhumanists of the world unite. We have immortality to gain and only biology to lose. Leaving immortality aside for the time being, even the one but last more modest sounding quotation contains the seed of many an objection against the seeming simplicity, universality and advisability of transhumanist vision. The notion of extending or enhancing human capacities by means of technology is itself thorny. As Babette Babish writes in her spirited contribution to the debate, quote, a phenomenological analysis of technology would remind us that the augmentation in questions is more, is more attuned to the machine than it is or can be cut to human measure, unquote. Our handling of technologies is only as enabling as much of virtuosity we have become, i.e. as much as we have adapted ourselves to the instrument. The more masterful or adapted we have become, the more dependent on the instrument in turn we are. Second, transhumanists such as Ray Kurzweil in announcing the new singularity or the supposed convergence of various strands of technological progress which combined will effectively transform us into a new species rely on the notion that all requisite technological conditions have more or less been already fulfilled, most of the developments already out there, which in turn begs the question how do we recognize such future, should it arrive or whether it is not perhaps already there. 
Babette Babish paints a vivid picture of the consequences of the problem. If the so-called transhuman, uh, so transhuman cyborg surely describes the human condition already well upon us, if the transhuman cyborg is the once triumphant and now disquieting Oscar Pistorius, or just the dishonored athlete for being, as we know all professional athletes to be, anabolically, hormonally transhuman, the cyclist Lance Armstrong, the transhuman is also a man with a pacemaker, or more reversibly, wearing glasses or contact lenses. The transhuman is also a man with a cell phone, doing business on the train or relaxing online in his bedroom. The question of moral right to such enhancement goes far beyond the consideration of individual liberties of a businessman in a suit who has just walked into an Apple store. In fact, it would mean to concern oneself with issues of the distribution of wealth, environmental protection, state regulation, and myriad of others. None of that sadly appears in the transhumanist adage on using technology to eliminate aging and greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. If the newly e-padded Wolf of Wall Street has just extended his intellectual and physical capacities, that does not yet mean he would necessarily become, through his purchase, a more developed human being, nor that he has just upgraded himself into a member of a new species, whatever, whatever might Arthur D. Levinson, the current CEO of Apple Inc., want us to believe, should he get converted by Ray Kurzweil one day. And what if the, business, what if the businessman buys a third arm instead of an e-pad? or an artificial womb, a set of nanobots that remove oxidants from his cells and defer aging? What if he injects the anti-aging bots into the bodies of all his employees, enabling them to work 12-hour shifts until the age of 80? Will they have become more developed, a new species perhaps, overman? But let us go back to immortality. Indeed, it is the word seduction that Nietzsche uses to describe the appeal of the ethics of seeing such visions as moral. Seduction, immorality, and immortality are all a problem of reproduction. As Babette Babish aptly described it, the problem is that we are born, not made. Above all, we are born, and this is the Heideggerian point, as we are born, thrown as we are thrown, and consequently we always find ourselves as happen to be. Not designed in accord with our preferences, had they been as we might have specified had anyone asked. The problem is coterminous with modernity, Babish furthermore asserts. Anyone who has forgotten that, in, that the turn of the century anxieties about war, about Jews and others were also very patent anxieties about women might perhaps revisit Otto Weininger's sex and character. Nietzsche has read famously asked once, supposing truth to be a woman, what, is it, is it the suspicion not well founded that all philosophers, when they have been dogmatists, have had little understanding of women? As Derrida shows in Spurs, Nietzsche's styles, the question provocative yet far from fanciful, has got far-reaching epistemological consequences. Therefore, it is worth paying attention to the transhumanist understanding of gender. Its purest case can be found in one more document published by the IEET, this time on post-genderism, or beyond the gender binary. Its main tenet goes as follows. Post-genderists argue that gender is an arbitrary and unnecessary limitation on human potential and foresee the elimination of involuntary biological and psychological gendering in the human species through the application of neurotechnology, biotechnology, and reproductive technologies. One of the main strategies for effecting such elimination will be implementing of assisted reproduction, which will make it possible for individuals of any sex to reproduce in any combinations they choose, with or without mothers and fathers, and artificial wombs will make bio biological wombs unnecessary for reproduction. The document also rather decoratively mentions social reform in its conclusion, yet the body of the argument deals ma mainly with surgical and hormonal solution, solutions to problems of reproductive, sexual, or even romantic nature. Administering the right drugs might even free us from the dangers of adultery, the author suggests, as we might be able, and this is an actual quote, wire our, to wire ourselves to only desire sex with the opposite sex, only with our spouse, to only desire specific sex acts, sex acts and to desire it according to an agreed upon frequency. Unquote. Again, a host of questions remains. Would people be willing or would they have to be coerced to use such drugs and by whom? How about those who cannot afford them? Would our carries allow for pregnancy at all if we could design our cyborg bodies or our offspring and obviate the biological womb? In promoting such stereotypes, legitimizing visions, transhumanists have found allies also among several techno-feminists. 
Notably, they can look back to Shulamith Firestone, who in the Dialectic of Sex published in 1970 claimed, the end goal of feminist revolution must be, unlike that of the first feminist movement, not just the elimination of male privilege, but of the sex distinction itself, so that the reproduction of the species by one sex for the benefit of both would be replaced by at least the option of artificial reproduction. Children would be born to both sexes equally or independently of either. Simone de Beauvoir in 1949 mocked the essentialist attitude in the following words. Woman? Very simple, say those who like simple answers. She is a womb, an ovary. Increasingly, this simple equation can no longer be held true. Several months ago, on the 1st May of 2014, Judith Butler said in an interview that she can see no problem with women having a penis and men having a vagina. People can have whatever primary characteristics they have, whether given or acquired, and that does not necessarily imply what gender they will be or want to be. For others, primary sexual characteristics signify gender more directly. This interview appeared in a magazine aiming to give a voice to trans advocates, yet expresses attitude of a growing segment of the Western capitalist population. With the surgical operations, hormonal therapy, as well as cultural re relearning trans people, uh, that the trans people had to undergo in the course of their bridging the gap between, and this is also a um, quote for, from Nietzsche, fit for war and fit for maternity, they already possess all prerequisites to be transhumans by more than just linguistic felicity. Even though female to male trans people cannot give birth yet, actually cases of pregnancy in, fem in, male to fem in female to male trans people have been documented. Additionally, trans visibility and activism, including artists uh, such as, uh, um, such as Heather, Kels Heather Kessels, Beatrice Preciado, Zachary Drucker, and Louise Ernst, have improved the acceptance of non conventionally gendered appearances already present in cultural imaginary thanks to the cross dressers, intersex individuals, etc., across centuries, although discrimination and violence against trans people still remain a significant problem. The di dilution of the strict gender binary, or as Firestone would have say, uh, would say elimination of the sex distinction, therefore does not appear to solve women's economical discrimination, which prob probably has to do with the social value of reproduction and therefore uh, other related uh, problems such as sustainability, etc. Made by Gerda Nair from the Stockholm University and Laura Bernardi from Switzerland who say, Feminist discourse shows how assisted reproduction technology has further decomposed biological motherhood and has altered the meaning of motherhood and reproduction. Feminist analysis maintains that despite the rhetoric of choice surrounding ART, these technologies have not increased women's reproductive freedom. Nietzsche is so irritating to thinkers of transhumanist ilk not only due to the obvious issue of the association of his ideas with German national so socialism. Perhaps less intuitively, it is also because his treatment of the figure of woman rightly suggests that the seemingly universal and mutual issues of truth and morality are never divorced from power and corporeal desire. When Nietzsche granted woman her own truth about truth, he had also enmeshed truth deep into the power and sexual relations. This allows his concept of a woman to function differently depending on each situation. Even when to the dismay of the feminist, she still largely remains a shorthand for an object of desire. Nietzschean woman thus illustrates the limitations of the dialectics between uh, resentment, uh, what is a reactionary behavior, and the will to power as understood in strictly Hegelian terms. Either at times woman is woman because she gives, because she gives herself, while the man for his part takes, possesses. Or else, at other times, she is woman because in giving, she is in fact give, giving herself for, is simulating the possessive mastery of her own self, uh, summarizes Derrida. We could call the first one the castrated woman and the second one the castrating woman. Yet there is still a third figure of a woman, the affirming one, who joyously embraces her own lack of essence. For, as Derrida summarizes, ultimately the question of the woman suspends the decidable opposition of true and non-true and inaugura inaugurates the epochal regime of quotation marks, which is to be enforced for every concept belonging to the system of philosophical decidability. Just as there is no such thing then as being or an essence of the woman or the sexual difference, there is also no such thing as an essence of the being's giving and gift. This is also what allows Nietzsche to use the metaphor of male pregnancy, as when Zarathustra says, 
Blessed is he who is thus pregnant, and so formulate his concept of ideal selfishness, a state of, I'm quoting, pride and gentleness that allows one to bring forth his, or should I add her, individual promise. The figure of Zarathustra combines features conventionally associated with both maleness and femaleness, surpassing the need to conform to a rigid gender binary without, an, without the need to erase gender as such. Uh, if this converges to any singularity at all, it is one that goes contrary to the vaguely catastrophic cataclysm some of the futurists seem to foresee, one that always sets away the resolution of our current problems into a kind of mist well, yet somehow darkly looming future against which we are immediately afterwards advised to take precautions and preferably according to the recipe they serve. This other singularity is that of our individual experience, including gendered experience. If female or male gender like the firm foundations of essence, then the idea of gender in itself is weakened. Ultimately, each person invents their own, echoing Wittgenstein, we could perhaps say private gender. Such undoing of gender is, if it is one, signals only that it is impossible to verify the correctness of each person's identification on any gender scale and left to their, and uh, therefore it should be left to their own discretion. They know how to choose the appropriate expression. The question is at what cost? There is another sense in which Nietzsche's idea of the eternal return is avoided by the transhumanists. As a cherished affirmation, it asks us to relinquish illusions of future singularity and instead ask ourselves, what if the singularity has already happened? Do we want this to be all we are left with, exactly as it is? If not, what is wrong now? Instead of a conclusion, I would like to illustrate how gender and uh, the recent technological and biotechnological and political changes can also be talked about. Uh, I will quote the work Tester Junkie by the already mentioned Beatrice Preciado, incidentally also Derrida's student. For nine months, Preciado took testosterone gel to pay homage to a close gay friend who died of AIDS and investigate the politicization, politicization of the body and the pharma capitalism. When I take a dose of testosterone in gel form and inject or inject it in liquid form, what I'm actually giving myself is a chain of political signifiers. I administer to myself a series of economic transactions, a collection of pharmaceutical decisions, clinical tests, focus groups, and business management techniques. I am linked by T to electricity, to genetic research projects, to mega urbanization, to destruction of forests and the biosphere, to pharmaceutical exploitation of living species, to Dolly the cloned sheep, to the advance of the Ebola virus, to HIV mutation, to antipersonal minds and the broadband transmission of information. In this way, I become one of the somatic connectives that make possible the circulation of power, desire, release, submission, capital, rubbish, and rebellion. But for the transhumanist, this already seems to be an afterthought. Thank you for your attention.